So for our scripture reading today, uh, it's coming from Matthew 18. And verse 1 through 7 first says, At the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through who they come. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with him. And now we invite our guest speaker, Jim Stauffer, to come share with us. And good morning to you all. Uh, before we begin this morning, uh, I need to tell you something that happened this past week is I was out in the garden picking up my cucumbers and things, and I walked in, and Jane accused me of bringing dirt along with my shoes, on the bottom of my shoes. You know, you tend to drag things in at times, and apparently I drug in a few people from EBIC this morning, and uh, uh, make sure you welcome them, or if you don't want to, that's okay as well. But uh, it's, it's good to have their support. I think that's what I'm going to get. We'll find out. But uh, <laughs> great. You know, some of you, uh, oh, the first thing I want to do here is uh, uh, do a couple of things. We're going to turn to Matthew 7. That's going to be our uh, initial text here this morning. But uh, is it possible to get some of the bulletins? Is there still some remaining? Is there an usher or something? That can help? They're all gone? Wow. Just too many people from eBay kind of thing. So, Because I was going to distribute those to make sure everyone had one, because even though you may not fill it out, the, the, the sermon, uh, there is an application here at the end I want to make sure you're ready for. So, okay, not a problem. Well, that's a good sign, I guess, if you got rid of them all there, Carol. Um, for those who weren't, weren't here last week, just to kind of give an introduction for those uh, who don't know me, which is pretty much everybody, I guess, is... Um, Jim Stauffer, my wife Jane here. Uh, we were blessed with four kids, Janelle, Jeff, Julie, and Jenna. They all live pretty much in the area here. We have six grandchildren, one just born a week and a half ago, little Calvin George, and uh, we're tickled about that. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, opposite of birth, uh, you think of dying, and I'll be 70 on Tuesday, so I start thinking more about that kind of thing as I'm where some of you already are or past that age. Uh, born and raised in Lancaster County, uh, I was a uh, brother in Christ all my life, as well as my wife, and um, came back here after retirement from Hagerstown, Maryland. I served there 33 years uh, at the same church, at a brother in Christ church down there in 2016, uh, finally came back to Lancaster County for me, and that's uh, been just a delight. Really, I've enjoyed uh, being a part of the Elizabethtown Church, and um, you can tell Pastor Adam I said that if you want. All right. Uh, what we're going to do is we're in the midst of, of uh, the three challenging C's. And last week we looked at commitment and the importance of that, uh, when it's worth fighting for. Today we're going to look at confrontation, uh, when it's time to speak up. And then next week, you all come back now, you hear? Criticism, when it's time to stop criticizing. So that's what we're... I'm uh, going to tackle this morning confrontation. And I'm going to begin with the story about the lion and the skunk. Mr. Skunk was kind of loud and 
noisy, and he thought too much of himself, rather proud. And he decided to challenge Mr. Lion to a fight. But Mr. Lion declined to do so, to do combat. And Mr. Skunk sneered and says, what's the matter? Are you afraid to fight me? And Mr. Lion said, no, but why should I? You would gain fame from my fighting me, even though I'd lick you royally. But what about me? I couldn't possibly gain anything by defeating you. On the other hand, everyone I meet for the next month would know that I was in the company of a skunk. Confrontation, we think it stinks, don't we? We just don't even like the word confronting. We stay away from it. We avoid it at all costs. And, and folks, here's the problem. We can't avoid, at times, confrontation. It comes to all of us. First word there for us. It, it's something that can't be avoided. It comes to all of us. Uh, life just involves movement. And when there's movement, there, there's friction. Motion creates frictions. We rub shoulders with each other. It's just the natural law of things. And that's why I brought along this. Wouldn't it be nice to have some spiritual WD-40 that we could just spray on all our problems? Uh, you know, uh, all our relationships, you know, where things would just kind of, I'm not going to spray this, although I'm tempted to, just kind of slide and glide along so that everything would move smoothly in life. You know, where we just spray it and, and things would run quickly and quietly and smoothly at home, at work, at school, at church, in our neighborhood, where we just kind of do a little spray and there wouldn't be any arguments with authority. There'd no longer be problems with our parents, with our kids, with the teacher, the pastor, the boss, our sister-in-law, and even that brother in the law, bro brother in the Lord, that everything would just go so great. Now that would be ideal, but it's not real. There's no can do with that. So we'll have to put that aside and just deal with the fact that we're going to have to deal with it. Uh, with the squeaks, the squawks, the sputtering, the gripe, the groans, the moans, how sometimes we get mad and sometimes we even try to get even. And we end up confronting someone about something. Again, it, it's unavoidable. How are we going to handle it? How are we going to do it? Are we going to do it with a baseball bat in hand and fight our way through? Are we going to yell and call people names? Are we going to give that message that we're upset and angry by speaking loud and clear, not saying a word. What's the best way to do it? I submit to you it's God's way. And that gives us, gets us here to Matthew 7. You see, confrontation needs to come after introspection, where we look at ourselves before we look at someone else. Uh, I trust you have Matthew 7. It'll be on the board as well. Here's how it reads in verse 3 and onward. Jesus says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Here, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, so then you will clearly see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What I believe the Lord is saying here is we need to make sure that we are right within before we try to make others right. Right? There needs to be a, a time of a real soul-searching, self-examination, introspection. And then, second of all, to admit, confrontation comes with great difficulty. I'm talking about a, 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 an issue, a topic here that's not easy. Uh, we're going to leave Matthew, and, and it's in 2 Corinthians 1 uh, that I want to talk about for a moment. 2 Corinthians 1, why is it so difficult for us folks to, to confront? I, I want you to respond verbally. We did this last week, and you, you done did a good job of, of just sharing with, with me a little bit. But why, why is it difficult? Why do we hesitate? Why are we afraid to do so? And, and uh, why is it? Why don't, why don't you want to do it? Or other people, if you don't want to refer to yourself kind of thing. Why don't we confront? Yeah, boy. Everyone hear that? We're afraid it's just going to muddy the waters that much more, yeah, make things worse. Yeah. Because the doing the action is a lot of 
lot harder than just leaving it be because if you do the action, then you're at fault for whatever happens. Yeah, we're afraid. Of, how's it going to end up? Okay, if, if it doesn't end up well, we're going to take the blame. Yeah, we're going to be at fault. Very good. Why else do you think we don't we don't like to confront somebody about an issue or situation? Pardon? Yeah, of hurting the other person? Yeah. Right. We're just afraid we're going to do more damage. Yeah, what's the cost? Is it going to be too risky? Are we going to lose out in all this? I think that's a big one. It really is. Wow. Good job. See, I can't do this at eBay because they don't want to talk to me, but... <laughs> Of being wrong, right? Yeah, there's that introspection again. You know, we're going to say, well, maybe I'm at fault in all this. Whoops. Kind of thing. Let me look at my notes. Fear of rejection, of being disliked, making matters worse. Man, you guys are good. How about this one? Uh, accused of being a hypocrite. You know, well, who are you to tell me I'm wrong? You know, you got your own fault. And... Yeah. Could it also be... We fear we lack the skill to go through that process. Like, you know, I'm, I'm going to make things worse. That was mentioned, you know. And I trust being here this morning, we, we'll, we'll work through this. You see, Paul here in 1 Corinthians expresses uh, some of the, the struggle he's, he's having with this church. And I'm telling you about this church. You guys think you're bad. Uh, the church at Corinth was a carnal congregation. I mean, they had all kinds of issues. Uh, by the way, you're not bad. You're good guys. I really like coming here. Might make it permanent. Uh, these guys, if, if you read through the two letters to this church, uh, there's division there. there there's cliques. Some are following Paul, some Peter. Uh, one guy is practicing uh, some sexual offenses, and, and he's not being disciplined in the church. Uh, they're suing each other. There are uh, is uh, women in the church usurping authority, and that's why he talks about the head covering in, in, the, in that letter. Uh, some are actually pigging out in the Lord's Supper. Instead of root beer floats, we're coming to church in order to uh, just get a little bread and wine. So what Paul does in this letter, he confronts them uh, on all these issues, theological, personal, relational, practical. And here in, in chapter 1, verse 23... I'm sorry, it's in 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians here, um, in chapter 1, verse 23, he expresses how difficult it is for him. And it reads this way, I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that he did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. He's saying here, you know... <laughs> It's tough. I'm working with you and all this. I'm trying to make things better and right. And then if you go into the next chapter, chapter 2 begins with this word. He says, so I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. When there's confrontation, there can be pain. And then he goes on in the next verse, for I grieve, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? So Paul's saying, you know, it's difficult, it, it's painful, it brings me grief. Verse 4, for I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. So we have all this. It, it, it's emotional, it, it's personal, it's, it's unavoidable to confront and there's different ways of handling this. And I'm going to give you that perfect number seven, although six out of seven aren't so great. And it, and it works like this. How to handle conflict. First of all, the first option you can do is walk away from it. Uh, the theme for this person is uh, peace at any price. Now, that's not always bad to, to walk away. I understand that. Uh, it's okay to walk away if the issue is of little consequence. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, let's say, and I'm sure this has happened to you, you're on the road, there's two lanes, you're in the left lane, the right lane is shutting down, okay, they're merging. And this guy to the right revs his engine and pulls in front of you quickly, even though you had the right away. 
Ever been there? Maybe even today, right? It's just the way it is. Now, what do you do kind of things? Uh, I would just say it's not worth confronting. I mean, typically, and I always think it's kind of comical, he, he wants to turn left, so he's, he gets in that left lane to, to turn, and you end up passing him anyways and saying, bud, didn't do you a lot of good, did it, kind of thing. But, but not to get all riled up and, and angry at, at this individual. It's not worth it. And, and again, when there are those times when harm is being done, yes, uh, we dare not walk away from it, but stand firm. Another thing people do, another way of handling it, is to whine over it. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Uh, they had this boo-hoo, it's not fair kind of attitude. Uh, the chronic complainer, uh, just whining, terrible confronter. Uh, do you like this guy's perspective? He says, when I complain, I do it because it's good to get things off my chest. When you complain, I remind you that griping doesn't help anyone. Now, it's okay for me, but not for you. Thirdly, how to handle conflict, you can kind of wink at it. That head in the sand kind of description. Sometimes we need to wink and just, you know, kind of let things go, not make an issue of it. Uh, we make the mistake of elevating what's insignificant to something of importance. Sometimes it's just best to laugh and let it go. I will always remember back in my younger days, before I was 70, uh, that uh, I was youth director at Roxbury Teen Camp, at, at youth camp. It was near the end of the week, and that final morning that I was there, uh, I was walking through camp, and this guy came, comes up to me and says, have you seen your van? And I said, what? He says, it's now unmovable. I said, what? And sure enough, there she was, my van, blocked up with all four wheels missing. And what these guys had done, the leaders of the youth committee, went to all the bother that night up to 2.30, pulling these tires off. Ah, I thought it was the ultimate prank. I thought it was great. <laughs> and what it made it even funnier is uh, one of the security guys told me that he actually held the flashlight for him. So, well, you know, what could have I responded? I, I could have, we don't get angry as Christians, but I could have been filled with righteous indignation and, and gone that way and, and yelled at these guys, chastised them. Nah, you just got to sometimes wink at it and let things go. Laugh a lot. Now, again, I'm emphasizing we can't ignore all issues in life. We need to identify and acknowledge when wrong is done. We have that responsibility and even a right to right the wrong when it causes harm. Well, here's the fourth way. It's not a good way, but it's one way. It's, it's to wade around it. It's that tiptoe through the tulips kind of thinking. Uh, a pastor was training his associate uh, in counseling and conflict management. So he places this guy in the corner of his office. And this husband comes in and begins to tell him all the, the woes and worries of his marriage, the problems they're having. And the pot, pastor's there nodding his head and, and tells this gentleman, you know, you're right. You're so right. He leaves and the wife comes in and again she shares her concerns and gives her version of what's happening in their relationship and the pastor's there and saying, you're so right. You're so right. She leaves and the associate comes up to the pastor and says, you know, how, how can they both be right? They can't both be right, can they? And the pastor nods and says, you're so right. You're so right. <laughs> Don't you know folks who, who just sidestep the issue, they, they kind of wait or things uh, around them, they, it doesn't do anybody good. And this might even be worse, the people who white flag it, they surrender all, they wave the white flag. Uh, you know, I surrender, I was wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, these are people that have kind of a doormat approach, they don't have that great a self-esteem, they, they just have the wrong kind of humility, they give in, they say, I give up my rights, do what you want, that doesn't solve anything either, does it? Number six is just the opposite. These are folks that just whack at it. I mean, they're ready for it. They have both sleeves rolled up, prepared to fight. They're that bull in a china shop. Now, these guys and gals tend to mess things up pretty well. They make major issues out of minor ones. 
Don't ask this kind of person, this abrasive, gung-ho, attacking person to confront. Uh, for one thing, you might end up missing some front teeth. They create lasting scars, maybe not always physically, but certainly emotionally, when they attack this way. But I want to go with the perfect seven. It's the best of the lot, and that's to work at it. To, to take seriously that responsibility that you have to others, to take seriously what the scriptures say. The, the Bible has a lot to say about how to handle conflict. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, to move through the next few books and, and check out some obvious obligations that we have as followers of Christ, how to handle this. Uh, again, if you're following in the Bible or the app, we're going to go to Galatians. Now, I'm going to give you a little uh, insight here uh, for free. There's, there's Romans and then the Corinthian books, and then there's G-E-P-C, okay? Uh, and, and the acronym I always used was Girls Eat Potato Chips. I guess guys do too, but the G-E-P-C, okay? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So you're welcome. We're going to go through all four, okay, real quickly here. We're not going to spend a lot of time, but we're going to start in Galatians here, Galatians 6. And there's this very instructive word to us, uh, what we're to do. It's the way chapter 6 opens up. He says, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. Isn't that a good phrase? Restore him gently. To, to lovingly, caringly, Christ-like confront, to restore a brother who may be broken. What else should we do? If you just turn a few pages to the right, uh, you're in Ephesians, and Ephesians 4, um, 14 describes how we're, uh, we too many times remain immature. We're like infants. We're, we're tossed around by the waves and by the wind of those who are cunning in their teachings and, and their scheming. And, and, and Paul says, you know, the way to grow, verse 15, is by, and here's a good phrase too, to be speaking the truth in love. Uh, it's worth not forgetting. Speak the truth in love. Don't, don't avoid those issues, those problems, but, but to verbalize and speak it. Speak the truth, but do it in love. You're not out to prove yourself right while you're destroying the fragile ego of another to, to, to do that. Your motive needs to be pure. Uh, taking that attitude uh, to make sure your motive is, is indeed right. Yeah, you head right again, and you're into Philippians, my favorite book, the book of joy. And in Philippians 2.4 has a good word for us as well regarding this issue. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And that's our phrase we're using, the interest of others. Looking out for their welfare, that's when we fare much better. You know, this book here is, is rather amazing. I've been in it for quite a number of years now as a pastor, as a follower of Christ, and I trust you have as well. And uh, the Bible seems to answer every need in life. Have you ever discovered that? Uh, I heard a guy say the Bible is more than front and back leather covers with pages in the middle. He said it's not two cows squeezing a tree, but it, it's more than that. Uh, and our topic for today, how to confront, is addressed over a hundred times in Scripture. Words like admonish, reprove, rebuke, correct, exhort, encourage. That's what we're to do. We're called to confront in the right way. It's not an option for us, but an obligation. And our objective is what? I, I want to give you three reasons why I think we need to confront to, to do this in the right way. First of all, it, it gives us a better understanding. We don't know the whole story. We don't know that person's perspective. So we need to come with a listening ear, ready to hear what that person has to say. Abe Lincoln had his share of adversaries. And out of experience, he reveals his formula for success when he says this, when I'm getting ready to reason with a man, I spend a third of my time thinking about myself and what I'm going to say, and two-thirds about him and what he's going to say. To have that listening ear, to, to better understand what that, where that person's coming from. 
A second suggestion is to have uh, that objective of a positive change, to, to be able to discuss in a mature way, to, to, to debate. Uh, we, we don't do that just to get our point across. That's pointless. But to work for good results, to, to see that we're better off when we're done than when we started. Now, I, I need to remember that change might come to me instead of that other person. How often we pray, Lord, change him, change her, uh, change everybody, instead of, Lord, again, that introspection, change me. At times over the years, folks would bend my ear and they would complain about the dumb thing this guy did or the uh, bitter per- word that this woman said. And, and in a tongue-in-cheek way, I say, boy, isn't it too bad everyone isn't like us? We need to truly realize we have our faults, and that person might as well. Maybe we could stand a tune-up, you know, just uh, to make sure uh, we're doing things right in our own hearts. Let the Lord change us when necessary and change another person when that needs to be done. When confrontation comes, let the Lord make positive changes that he deems best to, to have a better understanding, one, to, second of all, look for a positive change. And, and thirdly, out of all this should become a, a, a growing relationship. A, again, you folks mentioned here in that share time, we're afraid we're going to make things worse. We're afraid to confront because of that, uh, to create a wedge that will separate us forever. Uh, but when, when, when we do it the right way, confrontation creates... Uh, in, instead of a schism, a, a, a bridge, a, a bond, a, a budding relationship that will grow. Uh, again, head to the right, and this time we're in Colossians. Uh, there's three objectives that can be seen here, the three that we just looked at. A better understanding, a positive change, a growing relationship. And I, and I see this in Colossians 1. Paul writes in verse 9 uh, that without ceasing, he and his colleagues are, how's it read there? He, he says, we're, we're praying for you, we're we're asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom. That's the understanding, a better understanding. And then into the next verse, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. There's that positive train, change that, that you will bear fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And there's our last one, that growing in, in him, a growing relationship. Knowing these are things you, you folks want to have with others when, when, when you have to, to deal with this, to care enough to confront. I, I've listed a few opportune steps for, for you, you to consider. It's at the bottom of your page there for those who have those, that page. And, and, and first of all, when you have a problem with a person, go immediately. Um, read for us this morning was Matthew 18. Jesus says, uh, you know, you, you need to go and make things right with, with a person. You need to go individually. Uh, but also, you need to do it immediately. Uh, he says, when, you, when you're going to make a sacrifice, when you're coming to worship me, and you have aught or a problem with a brother, first you need to go and make things right, right? And then come and worship me. It's actually the second point, do personally, that deals with this idea of, of when a brother sins against you, you do one-on-one. Again, that was read in Matthew 18. A personal visit. Yeah, sometimes you've got to make a phone call if there's too much separation in space there physically. But how often folks, especially today, not so much a letter but an email, a, a text, we, we send someone and we send our little gripe. Do you know why I think that's not a good idea? Well, for one thing, you... There's no eye contact. You're not really dialoguing. You're, there's no body language. You really can't read that person. There's no inflection of the voice. That's a big one. What did this person actually mean when they said that? Uh, so, so do it personally. Thirdly, do it with the right spirit, uh, to have uh, the right motive. Uh, Second Timothy has a good word for us here. He says, don't 
have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because, you know, they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. Make sure your, your, your spirit is right. And then also, make sure you affirm the person at all times. To start on a positive note, uh, I had f- four kids, well, I still do, but they seem to be older now. But when they were growing up, there were times they did things that I wasn't really happy about. Uh, they had done wrong. Uh, and before disciplining, to, to talk to them, to speak before you spank. I, I know people don't spank anymore, but I guess I did a couple times. Actually, I got spanked a couple times. To, to, to let them know that you really care about them. Uh, before you, uh, you take, give them that time out, talk to them. I'm doing this because I love you. Let them know you care. In the same way with not only confronting a child, but anyone, to, to let them know you, you really care about that person, to affirm them. And then it's crucial to outline the problem, uh, what, how, and why, what. Describe what he's doing that, or she is doing that causes you the problem. How, tell how this makes you feel. Be, be honest with them. And then thirdly, explain why, why this is important to you. So outline the problem, make, make it clear. And then also encourage a response. When you share with the person how you're feeling and, and the problem that's there, there's a reaction. They're going to want to share their perspective. Uh, they may be shocked. They may be bitter. They may be resentful. And that person won't be ready to move on and resolve things unless you give them a chance to express their perspective, their emotions. Time to swallow the hurt, to, to let them talk, talk it out. But yeah, we're not good at that, are we? We seem to do all the talking. Now, the key to solving the problem is here. Well, after you've, you've come and, and, and you share and love and, and affirming that person, you describe the problem, giving them a chance to dialogue, to respond, then indicate the desired action to be taken, to, to say, where do we go from here, to focus on the future, what needs to be done. And, and, and at this point, you're going to see whether that person is just going to brush you off or they're willing to, to move forward, to remedy the situation. If he wants to change, he'll gravitate toward possibility of making things better. To finish on a positive note, repeat that person's positive points. And then finally, after all said and done, don't harp on it. Put the issue in the past. Never bring it up again unless the problem reoccurs and you need to. Uh, or, or you see positive changes and you want to affirm, you know, we, we had this problem and it's, it seems to be going a lot better. Now, the very first observation, way at the beginning of your outline there on confrontation, it, it does come to all of us. So none of us are absolved. None of us are going to avoid it. None of us are exempt. You've had to con- confront in the past. I'm guessing you'll have to somewhere down the pike. So here's what I'd like to do. A message is a mess unless there's application. What do I do with what I just heard? And this is what I want us to do here, okay? That's why I'm hoping that if you don't have a copy, at least someone near you does. And and look at the bottom of your section there, okay? These nine suggestions, um, these opportunities to confront correctly. If you look at those, uh, some you might do pretty well. Say, okay, I've been doing that. That's good. And there might be others you're saying, you know, I, I need to to zero in on this, and there might be one or two that really speak to you. Uh, I really need to check my motives and go with the right spirit, or I I need to affirm that person. I've been too critical of them. We're going to talk next week about criticism. Uh, I really need to share what I believe is the appropriate action that needs to be taken, where we need to go. Or maybe this and I, I need to learn to put it in the past and not harp on it and not hold grudges. Whatever it is, what I'd like you to do, either mentally or actually if you've got pen in hand, to, to take a moment and, and to look over that list and maybe just kind of earmark or circle one or two of these and saying, Lord, help me in this area. Just do that for a moment, would you?
Will you stand with me as we pray? Father in heaven, as you're hearing from us, your children, you know us, you know us full well. You know our foibles, our faults, our sins. And as we sang this morning, your grace, your mercy is there. And for that, we're grateful. May we, in turn, show that same kind of love and grace to those who do us wrong when we see them thinking much differently than we do. Um, there's too much division in our world today, in our country, and perhaps in our families, in our marriages, whatever the relationship is, Lord. We, we pray that uh, when we need to, to address the problem, to confront, that we will do so in a manner that is pleasing to you and that will truly be like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. As I thought uh, about sending you out with a good word from God's word, uh, I was drawn to Romans 12. And just as I was doing that, I saw the title above that chapter and said, Living Sacrifices. And I just glanced at that in your singing, that first song about living sacrifices. I said last week, I said today to the pastor, Ebik, there are no coincidences. There's just, things aren't coincidental, they're providential. And God just has a way of doing things. And I leave you with these, what I call pithy sayings, these short sayings, a few of them from Romans 12, talking about how love needs to be sincere, to be devoted to one another, to bless those who persecute you, to those who you need to confront and those who confront you, perhaps. Huh? It says, if it is possible within you, live at peace with everyone. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Every day, let us live for him.